Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. <laughs> All right, shall we start? Right. Yes, ready so you it's my pleasure to welcome here Neil uh, to, uh, well, as you know, we're very interested in computational science and identifying appropriate levels of complexity, what, what processes and, and, and how to model those processes in predictive models of the R system, for example, or in complex models of systems. Um, and so that's where I really came across Neil's work. He's, um, he's looked a lot at identifying <coughs> levels of model complexity and ways of putting together models in such a way that they can be rigorously tested and even shared. I never realized until recently um, that you were working on model building software, model building methods. Yeah. Um, so Neil's a professor, head of um, was it the Division of Agriculture and Environmental right. Sciences at the mm -hmm. University of Nottingham in Perry County. Uh, I agree to a talk with a very relevant and very profitable title alone, uh, so very much looking forward to it. Smashing. Well, thanks. thanks very much. Um, well, thanks very much for the invitation to come over and, and today. It's, uh, well, it's already been an education. I, had, I confess that I, I knew very little of the work that goes on here, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to hear something about it. Um, I hope this will be of interest. If not, there's quite a few photographs um, to keep you sort of entertained. Um, yeah, but we'll come to the, how the title sort of will emerge, perhaps as we go along. It's a sort of a talk in two halves. Um, I never quite know which is the which half to begin with, so it's a sort of slightly. Um, we'll just see how it goes. I wonder if anybody. Know, Matt's not allowed to answer. But I wonder if anybody knows what this is. This is Chernobyl nuclear reactor, the day after a famous safety test that exploded it into pieces. Um, it's not meant to have this great big hole in it. I like, occasionally I've done the versions of this talk to kind of um, people concerned about global warming and climate change and with interest in renewable energy. So I always like to introduce this as a low carbon energy source, although as you see, <laughs> it is faulty. So these are radioactive sheep in West Cumbria in the sort of early 1990s. Um, they're not terribly radioactive, and I don't think it's bothering them awfully, but um, nevertheless, a lot of sort of modelling work done associated with these, trying to predict um, the fate of uh, radionuclides in that system, which is how I got into this environmental science sort of business. And here we've got a field of wheat. I won't test your crop physiology. Oh, I don't know. They're leaning over. It might be barley. I think it's wheat. And this is a, a very unpleasant wetland in Panama. And this is one of our graduate students wading through it uh, to his field sites. And I'll perhaps I'll say something about some models of some of these systems as we sort of go along. So, oh, lots of people involved in the work I want to talk about. I won't go through all their individual contributions because it's a bit tedious, uh, but just to sort of give them credit. And also, um, thanks to various sponsors who've paid for some of this work. All right, so, let's suppose that we have some observations of a thing that we're interested in. Uh, what could it be? So maybe this is the value of the University of Nottingham Pension Fund versus time. <laughs> All right, and as I get older, I get more and more interested to know how this will eventually end up. And so we're interested to know how this is going to evolve. So maybe we make a model and we fit a model to this system. And maybe we think, well, you know, it sort of roughly follows the trend, but we're not entirely satisfied with that. So we make a more sophisticated model. Maybe we add some extra processes. And all of a sudden, we have something which describes the shape an awful lot better than it did before. And that's a good thing, I guess. But maybe we're still not satisfied. You know, and I've worked a lot with um, soil scientists and ecologists, and they're never satisfied, and they worry about these little deviations. So, so maybe we make another model that now captures all of the variation in those observations, and it hits every single one of those points. Of course, it's also now capturing all the noise in these observations as well, all the uncertainty and all the variability that's intrinsic in however the observations were made, field experimentation or whatever. So if we now went out and made a prediction with this model, that noise will come straight back out again and be included in our prediction. We've over-parameterized our description of that system. <clears throat> so a complex model can be made to fit any data, including the noise, 
and this is often referred to as overfitting or overparameterization and so on. And everybody in a sort of science business kind of knows this. So these graphs are actually from a kind of a classical paper about statistical model selection to, to sort of illustrate this point. So it's, it's a well-known phenomenon, um, but it's very hard to manage it when you're building complex uh, sort of simulation models, the sort of things that people are interested in from Earth systems modeling point of view. So as I kind of indicated from the photographs at the, at the beginning, for quite a few years I've been involved in making models of all sorts of different systems, merrily travelling this journey each time, making the models more and more sophisticated, until eventually you realise that quite often you go out to use these models to make a prediction. Quite often you're using a model that's a bit like this, it's just you didn't know it. So I've become interested, I suppose, in trying to understand where on this sort of axis of enthusiasm uh, to sort of stop. Okay, so that's sort of where I'm kind of coming from. So just to sort of illustrate it in another sort of way, um, let's suppose, I don't know how good the colours are for you here, but let's suppose we want to know this red thing. We want to make some predictions of this for some good reason. And we know these green things already. These are our driving kind of inputs. And in between, there's some sort of system doing its thing. Um, and we're going to build some kind of predictive scheme uh, to connect the red things to the green things. So maybe we arrive at this. Sometimes people think the PowerPoint's all gone wrong because these aren't labelled, uh, but they're kind of not meant to sort of upset anybody from any particular scientific discipline. Um, so we've got inputs going through various intermediate processes, one thing connected to another thing, connected to another thing, connected to eventually arriving at our object that we want to predict. Quite sophisticated, perhaps, lots of interconnection, maybe decades of research in each box producing appropriate relationships that could be used. And at the end, we have our prediction. And let's suppose we want to test this. I think that's what happens next on this. Yeah. We're now going to make some observations, some evaluation. Does this model work? Observations versus predictions, perhaps. Oh, yes, we have quite a nice correlation. Very satisfied with that. We can now use this model to, I don't know, predict global warming, die back of the rainforests, whatever it might be. The question that interests me is had we not had that sophisticated model, had we gone with something much, much simpler, would it have made any difference to this test? Would we have had exactly the same kind of degree of satisfaction with the outcome? Was all of that detail necessary? In fact, was some of that detail actually making life a little bit more difficult for us? So that's kind of an area that I've become interested in in the last few years and that's uh, the sort of stuff that Matt was referring to um, just now. Oh dear, lots of bullets. So this is my kind of rationale for being interested in what I would call model reduction. I want to assess whether this model of the system we have has got the most appropriate level of, of detail. One way of approaching that is to compare models of the same system, but with different levels of detail. But usually, you don't have lots of different models to compare, because each one maybe takes already a decade to develop or something. So what you do is you take the model you have, and you reduce it, producing simpler alternative model formulation, sort of based on the original starting point. All right, so let's... How to do this. Um, you see, you have a full, full model of your system. And I'm interested in this idea that, that, that this reduction is a sort of systematic process, very kind of iterative, perhaps, doing it automatically, not sort of driven by the, necessarily by the scientist. Produce a set of alternative model formulations and assess the performance of those. And I put that in quotes here, because you could do this in 101 different ways um, by making comparisons to how well the model works in relation to observations. And what do we mean by reduction? So if we go back to the diagram just now, there's lots of boxes. Well, how are we going to manipulate that? Um, it might be that there's some component in the model that we could just ignore, make zero. So maybe we have some diffusional process of some material moving. We could just ignore it and see what that does. But usually, because as I try to indicate in that diagram, these models are very interconnected, and you can't usually simply leave things out because you know, just, the whole thing will just collapse. So usually what one's trying to do is to replace each one of your model variables representing some process with your best, with uh, an alternative formulation. So maybe if you've got some sort of complex curvy relationship between two things, you might make them linear. Or maybe you would make something which is variable, replace it with a constant. So, for example, um, 
This, I think, is out of a crop model. So this is the rate of nitrogen mineralization in relation to temperature, varying over the course of a, of a year. So in the summer, it gets warm, and nitrogen is being produced in the soil. This is the relationship that's built into this, this particular model. What we would do in order to test this, or to, to sort of look, reduce this, we just say, no, that's not allowed. We're just going to take a constant value and make that apply all the way across. Now people, well, if you were interested in nitrogen mineralization soils, you would say, that's outrageous. It can't possibly behave like that. And that's the point, in a way. It would be interesting to know, therefore, if we did force our model to work in this outrageous and unrealistic way, does it matter? Does it make any difference? Does it make it worse? You would expect it to make your model a whole lot worse. And if it doesn't, then that sort of must be telling you something. So that's kind of the sort of little trick um, that we've been playing in our work at Nottingham. Oh, yeah, right. So one could imagine a model, sort of box and arrow type of thing, that we were describing before. We're going to imagine, in this case, we're interested in looking at the effect of three variables in the model. We've got our full model in which each of these variables is operating as designed. Okay, we have our appropriate sort of relationships built in. What we would do is we take the first step of the analysis would be to take that first variable and replace it with a constant. So it's now reduced. But the others are still in a normal way run the model, see what happens, do we get a horrible answer, make a not comparison to the observations of the real system. Then switch that one back on, reduce this one to a constant, then repeat here, then do all two, two together, and then finally end up with a model that's just a series of constants. And if this works, then obviously there's a whole lot of science that's got to be kind of thrown away. So this is an example where you imagine we're doing this with three variables. It could be that you might have many more than that. Um, here we've got a kind of exhaustive search trying every permutation. But obviously, if you start to have large numbers of these, then this becomes very large, and you have to think of cleverer ways to search the space, as it says at the top there, search the replacement space. But I won't bore you with all those details. All right. So here's an example. Um, oh, sorry, my tummy's rumbling. I don't know if the microphone picks that up too well. Um, <laughs> Uh, methane emissions from wetlands. So this is a kind of a classical model uh, by these guys, Walter and Hyman, um, from a, sort of uh, 10 or so years ago. This is probably the standard detailed description of methane emissions out of wetlands. It feeds into a whole load of kind of global models and all the rest of it because people are interested in um, methane contribution to global warming. The soil divided into layers. There's a wet part where methane is being produced, an aerobic zone where it gets oxidized and re reduced and relatively safe CO2. Lots of processes in here. Primary production driving some of this soil temperature. Water table is important because the more water, the higher the water table, the more methane is produced. It can travel by diffusion. It can travel by what is called here ebullition, which is hard to say. And really, it might as well say bubbles. I think that's what they really mean. Bubbles form and up they come, you know, marsh gas. Or it might go into the roots of the plants and just then use the plant as a bypass and go straight out this way. All right, so this is a kind of a full biogeochemical description of methane production. And Walter and Hyman have made this very nice model of this system. So just to give you an impression of how well it works, this is um, sort of our version of this model running with the data sets in the original publications. And they had it set up with uh, yep, five sites from various different unpleasant wet places on Earth, including a site very similar to the one we saw at the beginning there in Panama. Um, and these are the typical sort of graphs. Which one should we point at? Let's look at Finland. Methane emission versus time, basically observations that people have made, and then the model following that in quite a reasonable sort of way. Yeah. Most of the time, quite satisfactory. Is there any estimate of error about those observations you typically not have that? Um, you typically don't have that information. There is some of that information for some of these data sets, and some of the uncertainty in the observations is quite high. Okay. It is a difficult sort of measurement to make. Alaska is particularly sort of interesting because it's an unvegetated site, so uh, you have some sort of it that makes the model running more difficult, which is why it's got all these spikes. And actually, these fluxes are also much lower there. Just one more question. Here, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, are there any parameters that differ between those five realizations? Yes, there would be. There'd be some site-specific parameters in each case, some of which have been tuned to the observations in the original 
in the original model. So they have a kind of a production term. So in order to get this one as low as the observations, they have to turn that right down and then speculate about why it is that Alaskan soils are so lousy at producing methane compared to Panamanian ones. Uh, and these are then issues when they come to, because the model is also used for these global predictions. Those then have to be kind of, infer, those kinds of parameters have to be inferred on a box basis. Right, so these are then, in, our, in, in the sort of analysis that uh, I would sort of talk about, these are the variables that we then decide, well, we're going to test the effect of these. How important are these variables in this model? Yeah, so things like, for example, the water table, which is varying for each of these sites. Let's just make that a fixed thing. If, the, if you could do that, that would make this model much, much easier to use in terms of global predictions, because that's predicting the height of the water table is quite difficult. Same sort of thing for temperature and a whole bunch of other stuff. So like with the fluxes, let's suppose there are no bubbles. Let's ignore diffusion. Actually, if you can ignore diffusion, the model is a whole lot easier to um, sort of implement. Ignore some of these transport processes, and then with some of the various rates of some of the transformations taking place, you can uh, do stuff like pretend that there is no temperature effect on the rate of methane oxidation. Okay. Then we compare the model to observations. So we go through this process of iteratively replacing all of those uh, things with a constant. And each time, make a comparison to the data. We've seen the real data just now. This is just a schematic. So uh, in essence, what we do is to calculate a sort of a probability for each one of these combinations. If we find observations versus predictions quite a nice correlation, this one would be relatively high probability. And this one would be, which is more of a woof, scatter one relatively low probability. So a model permutation that produced this, you'd say, I don't believe that very much. I'm going to give that a low probability. Very happy to discuss the details of this. Please. This is meant to show holdout data. Is it different data from the ones you fitted the model to? These, in this particular, it would depend on what you had in the particular analysis. In this particular case, the only data is the data we've just seen. So it is data that's used for the fitting and for this evaluation part. Uh, in some of the analyses we would do, that you'd have separate data sets for different components for the fitting to the evaluation part. Just, just depends on what data you have and what's available. So if you fit the data perfectly, you'd call that the perfect model? You would. Yeah, if, if it was perfect, then you'd be here and you'd have that. Yeah. But your, earlier, your very first slide showing the three models, you didn't like the model that fitted the data. Perfectly. Yes, exactly. So uh, I think, that you, you, yeah, that's, that's the case where really, in the perfect scenario, you would have a set of data that would use to do your fitting and a quite separate set of data that would use to do the evaluation. Um, that would also be the perfect scenario where somebody was willing to fund enough people to go out and make all the measurements in the first place. So sometimes there's compromise here. Um, but however, there's no chance of this model ever giving that perfect fit. Um, so in a sense, it's... All right, so, uh, yeah, so we have our different ways here. There's all sorts of ways you can turn these sorts of things into a probability, some of which would try and account for the fact that you've got your model fitting included in the analysis that's just been sort of indicated. Um, oh, and I could talk at length about all of this, but I won't do. Um, essentially, what you do is you end up with a number for each of your model permutations, and you would normalise that so that they all kind of add up to one. And this, if you like, might be the kind of raw result. In fact, this is the result for this methane case. I think, I can't remember offhand, I think there might be three or four, 4,096 permutations of the way to arrange all those variables. This is the first 100. And this on the vertical axis is this sort of probability index. Statisticians would argue at some length about whether it's really probability. It probably isn't, but it's kind of a bit like it. Um, what it shows is that there's a permutation of the model which is... 0 0.1, 0 0.08, they're sort of going down. And over there, there's a whole bunch which are effectively zero. But the interesting thing here is that 0 0.1, 0 0.08, whether these are really different or not is open to question. There's a whole load which are really quite likely. There's lots of ways you could rearrange those variables in that model that would give you much the same outcome. Now, just to sort of show it in a slightly more... Oh, back to my little three-way diagram. So those probabilities relate to each of the model combinations. It's more useful, more interesting to think about it in terms of the different processes included in the, within the model. So if we imagined the same table as I sort of showed before, we're exhaustively searching through all of these different permutations. These are the calculated model probabilities for each of these 
different combinations of, of the variables. So this here is zero, so very unlikely. When we replace it all by constants, the model just gives a horrible agreement to the analysis, to the data. Here we've got a case where it's 0.4, so just replacing this one, apparently, we have quite a high likelihood. So what you can do here is you can calculate, add up, essentially, the probabilities for each of the variables in the cases where it is replaced. 0.05 plus 0.45 plus 0 plus 0 is a half, and so on. And I've colour-coded these here, sort of traffic light style. So if you have a variable with a replacement probability of 0, what this means is if you leave this model out, this variable out of your model, or replace it with a constant in your model, the model goes all horrible. And you get lousy predictions. So you could say this is required. If you get a probability of about a half, and there's a debate to be heard about what we mean by about a half, how close to a half does it have to be? Um, but if it comes out as a half, um, then I would say that's redundant. Whether you put that variable in your model or not, doesn't matter very much in terms of the level of agreement. You end up with the observations. You could leave it in, you could take it out. It, it, it's neither here nor there. Sometimes you get variables with a high replacement probability, and I would term those as noisy. So actually your model is better if you take this variable out and replace it by a constant. So when we first started this work, we assumed that we might find quite a few of these. Please, yeah. Sorry, I'm missing, I've missed something rather basic here. So I know, missed I, a step. I don't understand how the probability, if probability is defined as how well you fit your training data, then go, as you go down the, the table compared to your full model, you've, you've made the model less flexible. So I can't see how a less flexible model can fit the data better. It's a subset of the full model. Yeah, it's astonishing, isn't it? That's often, I mean, that's certainly quite a common kind of statistical reaction, is that the complex model must always uh, fit better. It must, must always fit the training data better because the, the model in which it's constrained is a special case of that model. So unless there's something strange with your optimization, you should at the very least do equally well. The point here, of course, is that these aren't, aren't in a strict statistical sense. They're not nested because you can't necessarily get to this model, uh, you know, with the, you know, some of these ones, directly from here. What we're doing here is we're actually changing the model. And we've got a sort of a, some kind of curvy relationship, and now maybe it's a straight line, or maybe we've made a constant or some other form of the relationship. Um, what we're saying is that this, as we've changed that, in other words, you could imagine, going back to my example earlier of the nitrogen mineralization varying annually, if that's the wrong relationship, that's just plain the wrong shape, it doesn't respond to that in that correct way, in that way, it might be that taking a mean value over the course of the year is actually closer to reality. But in terms of, in terms of fitting the data, I, uh, okay. I haven't understood why these models are not nested, because if you replace a, a straight line by a constant, that's a special case of a straight line. Well, we'd have to sit down. I think we'd have to sit down and go through the formulations a little bit. So you've got some relationships in which aren't necessarily going to collapse to a constant. Plus, all of the parameters in the model are not fitted. So in many cases, you've got some think of parameters which are fixed, essentially by observation or by experiment. So is this diagram misleading? Because I interpret this diagram as being you switch things on and off, but actually you're not doing that. You're comparing different things. You're comparing chalk and cheese, not the set of all cheeses with Gruyere. Sorry, my analogy is pretty... <laughs> 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 you slightly lost me on the way around the delicatessen. But, um, uh, yeah, I think sometimes I may have uh, skipped through some of this a bit too fast. So what I'm saying, these here, these are, in my terms, model variables. A thing in the model that's meant to represent something. So this might be um, the rate at which bubbles are going up our soil profile. Yeah. Now that, in turn, may depend on a bunch upon a whole bunch of other relationships inside the model, some of which um, uh, have got parameters associated with them, which are being fed in and are set, some of which are varying maybe with some of the other driving factors in the model. Um, it's not a simple sort of parameter, necessarily. Okay, it's to some extent defined by the way in which you represent the process of the model itself. And that's the reason why they're not strictly nested. In a, whereas if you had your sort of multiple, multiple regression model, series of linear models, then clearly as you switch some of the coefficients on and off, they are, you, oh, the whole thing just collapses. So, I mean, uh, and that actually, I mean, your, your point is well made, because this is the reason why when we originally found these, uh, certainly my statistical collaborator was horrified, because as far as he was concerned, this couldn't happen until we'd sort of puzzled through this thing. 
So what this really means is that you put something in your model, if this were the case, you put something in your model which is so at variance with how uh, the real system is behaving that it's actually making the agreement between the model uh, and the data worse than it would otherwise be. So it's very common to find lots of these, and sometimes you find some of these. Oh, here they are, all colour-coded. I don't know how well that looks to you. So this is the table I showed before, just the sort of titles of, of what some of these particular processes are. Um, and there's actually, I've ended up, unfortunately, with two shades of green, just around insult to injury. But in this case, we find one variable, one pro model process, I should call it, perhaps. Um, what this really says is that methane is being produced at a rate that varies uh, with uh, net primary production. Um, and in fact, it turns out that if you turn that off and just make that a constant, you end up with something that fits the data a little bit better than it did previously. So this one's noisy. These other ones are just redundant. So you could ignore the effect of temperature on oxidation. Um, you could just set the vertical distribution of organic matter in the soil just to a constant. It doesn't actually matter to make a big complicated shape out of that. You don't need bubbles and so on. So if you compare now, sorry, there's a question there. Just have a question. So how do you ever figure out the how do you ever figure out the, sp the replaceability space if you're if it's not a nested you know kind of forward backwards reverse model selection sort of thing if you're actually changing functional forms of each of these kind of response um, functions then there's an unknown dimensionality well, uh, space. No, the, it's, it is known. Um, I was almost certain I haven't explained it accurately. So if you imagine we have a very, maybe going back to my nitrogen mineralization one, in that case maybe there's two states. It can follow its original functional form or it can be a constant. Boom. Yeah, so you have... But well, that's just up to you. You just... Yeah, you would yeah. decide that. Yeah, so it's of course it's known if you say it can be exponential, linear, or yeah. constant. Uh, then it's all known. Yes, okay. So they yeah, okay, they are prescribed in that, that what one has done here is to identify a series of variables that you want to include in the analysis. And if that, that, that number could be larger... Yeah, and you could obviously, so with our thing that's got that annual cycle, maybe we could have made that a nice curve, yeah, without the noise on it. So then that would have been three options, and we could have done something more sophisticated. So that, uh, yeah, how long's a piece of string? Yeah. Is there also, I mean, without holdout data, effectively, the bits of the model you take out may mean you fit your training data better, but you're going to fit new data worse. Yes. You're not going to know that. You wouldn't know that if you didn't have, uh, did you call it holdout data? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so if you didn't have that extra set of data that you were going to keep as independent, yeah. then that would be the case. So I think it's always, uh, we're discussing this beforehand with Matthew, yeah, I, to some extent that's constrained by what you have available to you and how you then decide to sort of utilise that. There is a train of thought that says as you leave more data out, then of course your fitting gets worse anyway. So it's always a compromise between those two things. Um, I mean, going to the... I mean, there's a very interesting argument to be had. I'll explain what this is meant to be showing in a second. But on that specific point, so this is the data that's available in this uh, methane analysis. Uh, we could add to it by going out and gathering more, of course. Um, we could decide to have some of this, keep some of this data out and to make that independent. And then we'd have to choose, what are we going to do? Are we going to leave out every third point for each one? Or are we going to decide that, no, Michigan is going to be our holdback case? And I don't know if Michigan's ever been described in that way or not, but nevertheless. Um, now, that would probably give us two very different forms of holdback, uh, because probably if I leave out every third point here, it may not matter very much, and the models, we might give ourselves more confidence than we really deserve, where I suspect if I leave out one of these sites, especially, say, Panama, which is in, because it's in the tropics, is very different, uh, that might give us you know, a lousy outcome in terms of agreement for that holdback data. So one has to be this whole business about how you decide what you decide to leave out and how independent you really think that is is, is quite sort of in itself uh, all sorts of landmines there in my experience. Um, all right, but I feel myself drifting off on a quite a serious tangent, so I'll be careful. All right, so these are the data I showed you before. Observations of the red dots. And one of these, the green one, is the model as published by Walter and Hyman. And the blue one, it's sort of a blue, a sort of grey blue, um, is the same uh, predictions made with um, the model in which all of these redundant variables and all of the noise variables have been frozen to their uh, reduced uh, values. And the end result is really that it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Yeah, in other words, you could make this model a lot smaller. And for these data sets, um, 
the end result would be about the same. The model would be a whole lot easier to run in terms of you need less um, sort of uh, coding and all the rest of it. Um, and we don't know how it would then work at another site. Okay. All right, so um, we try this sort of thing with lots of different sorts of models. Marine models, lots of stuff on radio cesium. I should have sent those perhaps because they have got some proper holdout data um, and various other sorts of things. Um, and we always find these noisy and redundant variables every single time. Sorry to interrupt you, I've just got on the whole back case of it, it's coming up as a bigger issue perhaps than we anticipated. But I wonder whether, you know, as scientists, we often go into modeling thinking that what we're trying to do is find out roughly what's going on in reality. It's like a process of discovery, and that, that's what motivates people. Whereas in many of these applied cases, we, we need the best model. And then I think then that brings in a case, well, how are we planning to use the model in the end? And I think like the whole back case would be you would leave out every third if you were planning to use the model to interpolate sparse data. So if you only had methane yes. every day, but you wanted to have a methane you know, once a month, you want to get daily values. Whereas if you're using the model to predict you know, biomes that you'd never visited <coughs> before, actually the, the Amazon case would be, a, would be a fair comparison. You'd probably end up with a dramatically simpler model because it would say, blind, you know, if, you, if, if you've only got data on the temperate zone, you jump into the tropics, you probably can't do any better than a mean. Or, for instance, you know, you're, you're planning to use it in a six-month prediction mode where you've got six months of data and then you want to predict what's going to happen in the rest of the year. That obviously... So I, just, I wonder whether the, the answer to that is to match the, the holdout process with the, with the use case in the end. But that's a very kind of engineer's kind of predictive modeling kind of way to go in rather than as a scientific way. Um, I, I've, on the first part, I agree completely. I think if, you, if you're intending to use the model for some practical purpose, <laughs> and I guess that's normally why these things get funded... <laughs> Um, then uh, that practical purpose ought to inform the way in which you set up your model evaluation, whether that's in the choice of the measures you might use or indeed in the way you might decide to deploy your data. So in, one of the applications of this Walter and Hyman model is to make global predictions of methane emission for, or everywhere. And in that case, I think that the correct method would be to leave out some of the sites because what you want to do is to check that if you go to a new site, yeah, uh, but you cited some other perfectly reasonable ways in which you might use the model, in which case maybe you would use it. And maybe you would end up with a different model for each one of those situations. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, uh, to the purist on the science side, would find that a little bit unsatisfactory because actually we haven't now got something that's a really good conceptual representation of the behaviour of methane yeah. because we're saying it's different depending on what you want to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah? Exactly. So I think that's quite, well, I think that's quite fun actually. So um, uh, that comes back to whether you're trying to use the model, I suppose, to elucidate something about the way the world really is. Um, and maybe it's perfectly reasonable to have a detailed description in the style of Walter and Heinemann as your best conceptual representation, but then to have ways to kind of funnel it for different purposes and different applications, where maybe this is a sort of leaning towards that. Yeah. Was that studio originally to assess, you know, to produce a parsimonious model for predicting methane dynamics across the globe? It's five sites of data. Um, I think, well, I think Walter and Hyman's objective was to make a model of methane with the data they had and yeah, to just yeah. do the best that they could, and later that's been adapted and employed to, to do that. I mean, what Drew was saying is because if you try the same method using a number of different holdout schemes or whatever, and you ascribe the probabilities to the parameters or variables within the model, it actually tells you something about the relevance of those parameters to those yeah. different questions. Yes. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I mean, again, it's a, well, it's another version of the same sort of thing. All right, so just change tack slightly. I don't know if you recognise this person there lurking in the sort of the pastiche. Okay, there's a slightly more realistic picture of him. This is Popper, okay, for those of you who have um, kind of classical experience of science, philosophy of science. Um, so Popper was um, a very influential philosopher of science, and he, um, well, a lot of people have thought this before, but he kind of uh, systematised it, I think, where he, pointed out that you can't prove a thing to be true, you can only prove a thing to be wrong. Um, and he had, came up with this catchphrase of falsification. And I think this picture is called um, Plato's Fall and the Falsification. Okay, it's just quite sort of biblical kind of feel to it. I don't know if you can see, but in here there's Greeks falling over off their pedestals. Look, as Popper's kind of thinking about them, thinker style. Um, so his view of how a scientific process should be that you would propose a hypothesis and then you would test it by falsifying this hypothesis because you can't prove your hypothesis to be true but you can come up with some sort of uh, alternative scenarios to sort of challenge it. Okay, so um, 
Oh, and here's another one. Anyone we'll recognise this uh, handsome fellow? This is Fisher, okay, he was one of the early sort of statisticians. Um, and he took this idea, well, sort of quite independently, but he had also had this whole idea of inference, really, um, statistical inference, and that he could put a probability on these hypotheses. So now we've got Popo, falsification, hypotheses, and Fisher, who sort of goes to the next step and says, well, we don't just have to test these hypotheses, we can put a probability on them. And you kind of have all of sort of modern empirical science there, proposing hypotheses, test putting uh, some statistics on them in order to come up with sort of probabilities and so on. So quite nice. <clears throat> so a lot of people have thought about this in the context of models. These kind of bolt together, um, take a relationship, hope for the best, join them all up. Um, can we then say anything about whether or not they're realistic? And this phrase validation is so widely used. So there was uh, Ariskas <coughs> met out way back in 94, um, said that it's impossible to validate a law. So the italics here are my kind of comments, and the other bits are probably unfair quotes that I pulled out of the papers. The gist of what Ariskas is saying is really what Popper says. You can't prove a model to be true, because you can't prove anything to be true. This is what she says. If it fails to produce observed data, then we know the model is faulty in some way. I would say we knew it was faulty already because we already knew that half the relationships we put in we just hoped for the best with, that they were best, at best approximations. What would be useful to discover is which of the components are faulty. Um, I'm going to go through all of these points. This is quite an interesting one. So this is, I put on here how many citations they have because I, you know, these days in academia at least we have to count these like mad, so... I looked them up for all of these kind of classic papers on model validation. Um, so following on from a risk is Reichel, what he does really is he says, well, okay, yeah, it's right, you can't validate a model, you can't prove it to be true, but we do need to evaluate and test them. Um, and certainly if we've got a particular purpose in mind, going back to the sort of engineering application, and, he, and in fact he uses exactly that sort of terminology, then he comes up with a sort of what he means by validation. So you, in the context of your particular predictions, what you mean. And he also goes on to argue that this whole idea of validation is less important if what you're trying to do is to develop your system understanding, following the scientific kind of avenue that was just suggested. And I think this is a bit perverse, um, because surely you're going to, thinking back to Popper and Fisher, if we challenge our, our models in some way, then we might help to try and test which components of them are working and, and sort of test our to push our understanding a bit further. Now, Bevan. Bevan's quite interesting. Lots of work here. He's a hydrologist, really, so he's sort of coming from that sort of uh, part of the world. And what he's observed is um, that it's very common that you can have loads of different models that will give you the same, uh, very similar in relation to your data. Um, he doesn't think it's useful to follow this idea of truth, because all of these models are wrong to some extent or other. But we should be interested in relative comparison. And this is particularly interesting. The aim is, over time, to move towards the representation of reality. In other words, there is a reality, and you can maybe move a little bit towards it with your models. And what I would interpret this as saying what he's suggesting is it's useful and then perhaps worthwhile to try and find out what is the correct sort of conceptual representation of your system. And that seems to be a useful thing to be able to try and do. I would, and that goes back to this sort of trying to pursue the sort of scientific line of arguing. And I think the last one of these, I hope, um, these guys are really arguing for testing of alternative models, fully in line with Popper's scientific philosophical school. In other words, to compare all these different models of the system and to see how well they're working. In practice, it's very rarely done. I think it's because it's rather hard. Um, yeah, so this whole idea of falsification is sort of lurking there. And they also point out, I, was quite, I think this is dead right, actually. I, it's certainly it'd be interesting to sort of demonstrate it perhaps in a somewhat more systematic way that the typical situation with most of the models that are used, certainly in environmental context, is that in some way it's, it's a faulty conceptual model in the first place, but we get away with it because we bias the model parameters to force it to sort of fit in some way. All right, there we are. So I put my noisy variables and all the rest of it with um, Fisher on his pipe and Popper here doodling on Plato. Um, all right, so my conclusions, concluding remarks, they're not really conclusions. Um, it's very uncertain, when you formulate a model, it's very uncertain. You don't really know what are the correct relationships to put in there. 
And I think reduction provides a way to sort of test that. Um, and that maybe that that could be done in a way that's consistent with some of the sort of philosophical thinking uh, that's gone on and been very successful on more empirical sort of observational science. Um, trying to test the ideas that are in, built into these models, not test the models as a whole. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily argue, in fact, I probably, I probably would normally say one shouldn't. Having reduced a model and found a simpler version that's just as good, that doesn't mean that's what you go out and use. I think that means you need to go back and think about why is that the case? What has that demonstrated? Um, so I think it's more of a diagnostic. So there's a famous quote that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. I think it's box, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. I just sort of paraphrase it slightly. So all models are wrong, but some bits of models are useful. Feeling that might be the last one. Oh, you can't read all those, but um, if anybody's interested, there's a whole bunch of papers there which are sort of connect roughly to this. Some of them by us and some of them are quite good. Not by necessarily ours, some of the other ones. <coughs> if anybody wants that, then... Well, it's on your computer anyway. So. Yes, well, we went through a phase where people said, you know, you need to get your paper cited crap, so um, one looks up and sees what's the sort of running targets. <coughs> I think oh, Oreskes has got thousands. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>